It is my privilege to uh, welcome this evening to the Village SDA Church um, platform and pulpits a good friend in ministry, uh, Brother Scott Ritzmer. And Brother Scott uh, is the co-founder of the Liberty and Health Alliance, and he is a featured presenter on Satellite TV. He received his uh, master's degree in social science in 2007. He is a husband, he is a father of three children, and he has presented seminars on the effects of social media throughout the Adventist Church worldwide for the past 12 years. And it gives us great joy this evening to welcome uh, Brother Scott Rizma to our platform. The topic of his, ty of his speech or talk will be from social control to social credit. And before, Scott, um, we uh, hand over the pulpit to you, let us pray for you and ask for the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for calling and equipping Brother Scott Ritzmer into a very important ministry. And Father, before people were talking about it, he was raising the alarm about the terrible impact of social media on the brain. Father, he's been warning your children for many years that we need to walk in the light rather than wallow in the darkness. And Father, I thank you for bringing him to us tonight. We thank you for his ministry, for the gifts that you have given him. And tonight, Father, as he speaks and shares what you have placed upon his heart, I pray that your Holy Spirit will speak through him and for him, that you will be glorified in all that he says, that every person watching this program will be drawn closer to Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Thank you, Father, for hearing and for answering this prayer, because we pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Thank you. It is such a delight to be back at the Village Church. I was looking at my calendar. It was 10 years ago that we were doing Media on the Brain at this same church, very early on. And so uh, Religious Liberty is even more of a delight for me to present. I, I've loved doing seminars on media, but you know what was a passion of mine even before I came into the truth and understand Jesus as I understand him today was liberty. And it was actually the reason that I am Seventh-day Adventist today is largely because of our religious liberty message, because of what it tells us about God's character. And I was actually writing a book prior to encountering the Adventist movement, and it was about the relationship of Christians, of the church, with power. It was about the Constantinian worldview and the use of the sword. And then, voila, there's a movement of people who understand this history and are clarifying it. I read this book, The Great Controversy. I was thirsty. I was hungry for that book, and I didn't know existed. And when that happened in my life, it was life-changing. So to be able to be together for a weekend themed on religious liberty, but really isn't it themed on God's character? Because that is a God of love, requires freedom in a universe of free will in order to be love. And it's also a very special time to be doing this weekend together. Do you know what else is happening across the ocean? It's, by the way, welcome to everybody online all over the world. I realize that we've got quite an online audience joining us tonight, so welcome to you all. But in Davos, the World Economic Forum is meeting at the same time, and I found that to be interesting. So we're having a Religious Liberty Weekend. Also, the same time, there was just news this week where the Swedish Ministry of Defense is scaring everybody, saying, prepare for war with Russia. And I'm thinking, are we going to be having non-combatancy talks at our Religious Liberty events in the near future? But when I hear those things, you know what I just listened to? The voice of Jesus in the book of John saying, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid, Jesus said. You know that when the signs of the times happen in this world, men's hearts fail them for fear for what is coming upon the earth. But what does he say to us? When people are dying of fear out there, he says, lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. That is the privilege and the response of the Christian who believes in prophecy. Now, those who follow Belt of Truth Ministries, by the way, if you don't get our newsletter updates, email me, beltoftruthministries at gmail.com. We've got a very big current events 2025 update coming out 
in the, in the coming months. You're not going to want to miss it because we're looking at a number of historical cycles, a, m- a number of trends that are beginning in earnest in the next year or two, looking at the cyclical view of history and what to be expecting based upon that. Cycles are not deterministic, by the way. God is sovereign. But if all other things being equal, what kind of things might we be headed toward? Very, very eye-opening things. And wh- by the way, when I say God is sovereign, this is, this is a biblical truth. But is it also not a is it also not evident in recent events? We see things that should be massive, explosive events upon the world that end up kind of more of a whimper than they would have otherwise been. COVID-19, 3.5% death rate, case fatality rate. Remember when that was the leak coming out early on in January of 2020, and it ended up a lot less of a, of a, of a, of a, of a death rate than that. There was uh, 9-11. There was a plane that went down in in Pennsylvania. Where was that supposed to hit? And what kind of Patriot Act on steroids might have come out had the greater destruction happened that maybe was prevented? So in Revelation 6, the angels are pictured as holding back the four winds of strife so that they do not blow upon the earth with such magnitude that the work would not be finished. What is the work? To receive the seal of God. So we're called to work while the day lasteth, aren't we? Did you know that just what happened a few months ago, the Hamas attack on Israel, the the Hamas was actually jumping the gun. This was going to be a coordinated attack in November. It happened on October 7, of course, just Hamas would have been a lot bigger of an event. So a lot of major world explosive events that could have really put things in a more precarious situation seem to be held back. January 6, another example. When you read the scripting and listen to the politicians after the January 6 event happened, you hear things like, this was the biggest attack on our country since Pearl Harbor. And I'm going, wait, what? I mean, bigger than 9-11? So was there supposed to be something more? Good questions to ask, but we've got the report, the update coming out on current events 2025 and following, and that's not for tonight, though. Tonight's message is from social control to social credit. With the popularization of the term mass formation in recent years, social control theory has launched into the mainstream popular consciousness. And basically what we're talking about is a effort to engineer what they call the group mind. You'll hear these quotes later. A social mind, a singular public mind. So that people then become, may I quote from the book Education, mere reflectors of other men's thoughts. So you become part of the mass and you become possessed by and subsumed into a group think mindset. The Bible says it a lot more succinctly than that bundle of words I just threw at you. How about this from Revelation 13? The whole world wondered after the beast. There comes that scenario where there is a global coalescing around a major error. And so here we are to think through recent history, what's coming in the future, and how we can establish ourselves upon the word of God. I want to have another prayer as we begin. Father in heaven, thank you for the privilege to look to you as our God of love, to celebrate your gift of your Sabbath today, and most of all, the gift of your son, Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath. We thank you that he is the one in whom we may live and move and have our being, We thank you that he is our provision, that in Christ alone all our hope is found. May we not have fear as we navigate these difficult topics. We know that you have the destiny of this world and of each of us in your hands and that we are secure and complete in him. In whose name we pray, amen. Amen. After September 11, 2001, an American talk radio host staged a hoax on his listening audience. In this jaw-dropping hour of radio, he suggested to the listeners that we must begin to identify the threat in our midst, all people of the Islamic faith. Now, he was testing the reaction of those in his audience to a number of absurdly discriminatory suggestions such as requiring all Muslims in America to wear a distinctive armband or a tattoo identifying them with the crescent moon-shaped tattoo as Muslims wherever they go. Then he opened the phones up to the callers to see their response. Now, a few of them did say, you're off your rocker, but others, a surprising number of them, agreed and said he didn't even go far enough. And they made even more horrific suggestions like 
internment camps for all Muslims. And it wasn't just a few fringe callers to a radio show who felt this way. A Gallup poll taken during that same year of 2006 found that a full 39% of Americans agreed in polls that Muslims in America should be required to bear a unique Islamic identification publicly. This horrific news made international headlines. Speaking like a dragon. It was a wake-up call to students of history that the latent fear and bigotry that we had hoped was a thing of the past is just simply awaiting the right context to again spring to life. And if we aren't all vigilant, then it's not a question or a matter of if these types of things will transpire again. It's when, not if. And then it happened. In January of 2022, nearly half of those who identify as one of the two major political parties in America, when polled and surveyed, agreed with this policy. The government should require citizens to temporarily live in designated facilities or locations if they refuse to get a COVID-19 vaccine. Internment camps for the unvaccinated. Speaking like a dragon. By the way, if, if you read and hear things like it would be appropriate, this has been stated publicly in publications you might have read, for the unvaccinated to not be able to travel and work and be a part of the community freely. We, we must call that speaking like a dragon on all sides of the spectrum. The Bible says, see to it that no one takes you captive. Because we're talking about social control. Social control to capture the minds of the masses toward a totalitarian end. See to it that no one takes you captive. There is freedom in Christ. The hollow and deceptive philosophy of this world that says we will lord it over our fellow man, we cannot be taken captive by that. We can follow what our Lord Jesus taught. He said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. Matthew 20, verse 25. And their officials exercise authority over them, but not so with you. If you want to be great, you are the servant of all. So it's the Gentile, the worldly way is to lord it over others. Not so with you. That would be, lording it over others would be Constantine, not Christianity. God is love. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So we're talking social control. I've had the privilege to teach on that even before we did seminars on media and worldly schooling and how those are agents of social control. I got to do this in the classroom, uh, teaching history, government, economics. And to begin with, you should probably understand there are typically two modes and mechanisms whereby social control is exerted upon a population. It is through authority or conformity. Let's take these one at a time very briefly. We don't have time to give all the details of these landmark foundational behavioral science, behavioral psychology experiments, but many of you are probably familiar with the Stanley Milgram experiment. Milgram was the one that had people electric shocking people. They weren't actually being electric shocked, but as far as they were concerned, they were. And what he proved was a man in a white lab coat who assumes an air of authority and declares it is imperative that this continue issue the shock the person who is the subject of that study the guinea pig will continue to the majority of them will continue to obey that order even over the protests and screams of the person being shocked they believe that person is being shocked it's an air of authority that seems to negate conscience and you see it acted out in history as well on the right is the Solomon Ash experiment. You see two cards there. Which one does the line on the left match with? A, B, or C? That's a very easy question, right? So he asked questions like this with these cards to remove any error from the equation so that everybody would get all those questions right. But then you got seven people who are in on the trick, and then the eighth person in line, and you got all these people answering these questions. You go right down the line, and the seven people ahead of time are prepped to answer certain ones of these wrong. He does a number of pairs, and then seven people in front of the guinea pig, number eight, are saying, well, clearly this one, this is A. Well, you all know it's C, but they go right down the line, A, 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 and everybody says A. Now, person number eight is encountering an awkward situation. Will he overrule them? The majority of people answer wrong with the group. And when Solomon Ash uh, interviewed them, many of them said that they didn't even realize they were answering incorrectly. Their eyes were playing tricks on them. So conformity, the peer pressure of the group, 
can negate reason. Now, it'd be interesting to swap these and see, can authority negate reason and can peer pressure and conformity negate conscience? I suspect that is the case. But what do these two have in common? The authority and the group, they both elicit fear in the subject. Fear of not fitting in, fear of not pleasing this person with this self-proclaimed authority. This is a false authority, by the way. We believe in biblical authority and godly authority, of course. But these areas of the brain run contrary to one another. When fear is up, it's like a teeter-totter. Reason and conscience are not engaged as they are when you're in a state of, of calm. The amygdala and the fear circuits tend to handicap our ability to have altruistic love, reason, and conscience, which I guess this makes it all the more important that we never, as individuals in our lives, that we never become elated by applause or dejected by censure. Have you ever read that in a book called The Desire of Ages? Jesus was never elated by applause or dejected by censure. We do what is right because it is right. We stand for the right though the heavens fall because there is nothing more hateful to God than neutrality in a religious crisis. And because outside the city in Revelation 21 are the fearful next to the liars and murderers and adulterers, etc. Well, this term mass formation was coined and popularized by Matthias Desmet, Belgian scholar, now it's in the nomenclature, so this kind of is the most potent form of social control in the literature, um, basically a mass hypnosis that overtakes people's thinking capacity, a group think in the strongest sense of the, of the word, a irrational mass becomes harnessed a, a toward a totalitarian end, and that is demonize, persecute the other, the other. We've just been through a mass formation event. In fact, it was the first global, the biggest ever. So this is coming toward Revelation 13. You know, Revelation 13 will be the final one. It's going to be the biggest one ever. The biggest groupthink persecution, the biggest mass formation event. So we should understand a little bit about it, about the dynamics of it as we head toward it in our world. There may be other ones before it still, but that's going to be the final one. Revelation 13 persecution. There are several social conditions that... Pre -condition, that, that are prerequisites for a mass formation event. The first is that in the society, people are socially disconnected from one another. Uh, can you see that this is the case in our world today and in leading up to COVID-19 crisis? Of course, yeah. I mean, with social media, we have become more disconnected than ever. But we're the most socially connected generation in history, says Mark Zuckerberg, about the social media. You can be with everybody and anybody all the time online, right? Is that real social connection? The former Surgeon General of the United States says we have a loneliness epidemic based on the literature on this. A loneliness epidemic. So the most socially connected generation in history has become the most lonely generation in history. It must not be real social connection. And by the way, God has the answer to all of these preconditions of a mass formation event. He created us in his image. Actually, can I rephrase that from Genesis 1, 26 and 27? God said, let us make man in our image. And then he makes Adam. So far, it's just Adam. It's part of the way through the day six of creation, and Eve is not made yet. There's no sin yet, of course, but God says something interesting there when only Adam has been made. It is not good. There's no sin yet, but he says something's not good. In other words, it's, he's not done. Because Adam, how about this? Adam has been atomized here. We've become socially atomized in our culture. He was a soul singular being. He can't perfectly reflect the image and character of God. God is in us a plurality. Let us make man in our image. Then you've got the two shall become one and the family and the church family. And now we can reflect God's character. This is how he's created us to thrive. No wonder social dysfunctions happen when we become disconnected from one another. By the way, you get off social media and in this study, they didn't even instruct people what to do instead. They just told them, take a fast from social media for one week. Young, young adults in Denmark, 36% drop in loneliness in just being off social media for one week. Isn't that something? Um, the second social condition that prefigures a mass formation event is a lack of purpose and meaning. Meaning comes most from, from community, of course, but also from, from the family, from faith. So one of these leads to another, but our society, are we struggling with faith? I mean, we live in a highly secularized, nihilistic society. And no need for faith in that society, so they thought. And then we see the results. We see mass formation able to take hold that much more easily. How about the family? 
God instituted the family to reflect his character, so of course Satan hates it, and he's going to attack the family. The assault on the family is a large portion of some of our seminars. One of them, we've got a clip of a um, cable news public service announcement. And you've got a public official with a straight face saying, for far too long we've had this private idea that children belong to their families. We need a collective view of parenting. These are our children. And we all with mouths agape say, did we just hear that? It is young women being told serving corporate America will be more fulfilling than the most beautiful thing God's granted to mankind, motherhood. Young men are told your masculinity is toxic. How about the community? Community, family, faith. We'll come back to family in a second, but your nation, nationhood is bad. Your nation is bad. Nationhood is inherently racist. And when young people start getting these messages and ideas, you start having lack of purpose and meaning when family, faith, and community are crumbling. The assault on the family. I can share with you a quote from the, the, this was the guy who wrote the definitive history on the early development of American education. His name was Elwood Coverley. So the American public schooling system, in his view, he says, Particular, in particular, the attitude toward control of the child is likely to change. Each year, the child is coming to belong more to the state and less and less to the parent. The plea in defense that the child is my child will not be accepted much longer by society. And that's fulfilled by that clip I was mentioning earlier. By the way, beltoftruthministries at gmail.com. I'll send you that clip because I don't have time to fit it all in the message, of course. But uh, you'll want to see that and hear it for yourself, not take my word for it. Uh, this is the book Social Control by Edward Ellsworth Ross. This revolutionized the social sciences in the early 20th century. It was the uh, progressive era of social control. And after its publication, psychology, sociology, political science picked up on social control and said, let's go with it. His message was the idea is to collect little plastic lumps of human dough from private households. So you see the family being brought into this social kneading board, the children being little plastic lumps of human dough. That's slightly creepy if you ask me, but fast forward to the 90s and you get a book called It Takes a Village, and this one is painting this idyllic future. Imagine a country, and it goes on, it says, children, underlined there, before they reach the age of three, being in full day programs. It talks about sparkling classrooms with these very young children. Wait, before the age of three, in state government programs, full day school programs. How, are, how old are you before you're the age of three? This is toddlers. This is two-year-olds and presumably younger as well. This quote alone, by the way, is enough for me to go yes to the Spirit of Prophecy Council that the mother is going to be the most suitable teacher for that child till age eight or ten. This book, by the way, had spiritualist influences. That's a whole other topic that could be discussed. Again, email me. I'll send you some stuff. But um, free-floating anxiety is the third precondition for a mass formation event. It's basically free-floating, meaning people are anxious about something and they don't quite know what it is. So I just don't feel right. And I, well, maybe it's a lack of family, faith, and community. Maybe living online isn't actually how God designed for us to live. And, and speaking of anxiety, the same study that took people off social media and found their loneliness scores dropped 36%. Their, um, their anxiety scores also dropped by that same amount, and depression dropped 33%. So that's good news. You replace so much screen time with nature, with, with, with service, with living life God's way and being, learning how to be human again. That's God's solution to all of these problems that, pre, that, that, that set the stage for Here's where it's go time with the mass formation event. A narrative is now distributed to a demonization campaign to give a place to put that anxiety, a scapegoat. It's them that are to blame, the other. And in latching onto this narrative, now your anxiety has some explanation. They're the reason I'm, t I'm feeling not right. Yeah, that's the pro cause of all the problems. So there's a bit of satisfaction in having that scapegoat. And then also, remember, socially atomized, you now have a tribe. You belong to a group that is against them, a group of superior intellectual and moral capacity, and then a cause to deal with them. This is the sad story of history in so many cases, and the future. Revelation 13 has a demonized group, commandment keepers, 
the scapegoated ones for all the natural disasters and stuff. Those who were taking the mark, they will be of the, 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 the ones that are the moral high ground, persecuting those who are of the commandments of God. And the great cause for them will be to shut them down, and it goes to no buy, no sell, and even death decrees. Historically, it was the witches in Salem, the Jews in Germany, the bourgeoisie in Russia in 1917 and many other places as well with the communist revolutions, the, the kulaks in Eastern Europe, the blacks in Jim Crow America, the white farmers in Zimbabwe and South America, in revolutionary France, that's more recent, in revolutionary France going back over 200 years now, the aristocracy, the church, the monarchy. It's just a blob of tissue. Now, I know, of course, that the unborn haven't had that demonization campaign, but how about a neglect campaign of the value of that life? And then more recently, it's a pandemic of the unvaccinated. They're the ones transmitting the virus. By the way, on a personal note with these two items on the screen, we all have a humanitarian impulse, I think. That is, that is appropriate to go through all these examples. But the ones that are especially important to me is when the name of our Lord is on the line and institutions that bear the Christian name. If we are participating in the genocides, God forbid, we've got to have a reckoning. And I like the 2019 statement. I know there's debates about that. I like it okay. But was there a point where we really came to repentance to placing into motion measures to be sure that this never happens again and that there are corrective measures in place to not go there. We're talking about abortion in our own institutions. Historically, about a quarter of the society when a mass formation event happens become the true believers, the ones who are all on board. In Revelation 13, you get Mark of the Beast in the hand and the forehead, right? These are the true believers in the forehead. This is my cause. And from that group, you recruit your KGB, your red guards, your brown shirts, etc. in the most extreme cases of authoritarian governments. Then the majority of the population actually realizes there's something not quite right about this, but they're silent. And you know, go along with it. And from that group are recruited the collaborators and basically the compliant sector of the population. A small minority break the conditioning. Some of them get sucked into violent actions. And so we just got a big old mess in the context of tyranny. But it's the, those who will stand for the right, though the heavens fall, with the gospel message, with the character of Christ, to even love the persecutor. That's an important point, isn't it? Should we bless those who persecute? Jesus said to do the same. Don't view the persecutor as an enemy, as an adversary. The Bible says our battle is not against flesh and blood. Our battle is against Satan. View that person or that movement or though that group as casualties that we've lost. They're, they're, they're part of humanity. They're fellow humans. They're casualties whose minds have been lost in a psychological war. And they're not beyond, I mean, nobody's beyond being saved till well, probation's hour remains. But view that as a casualty of our own, not as the, a new other. And now we've got a superiority, legalistic, pharisaical attitude. So in our own hearts, how do we deal during difficult times with keeping our minds pure and Christ-like? View those as victims, as casualties in the psychological war that is happening all around us. And at the same time, speak the truth in love. Jesus was filled with both grace and truth, right? Can we do both? And can we say, have we learned some tough lessons as the people of God over the last few years? Have we come back and said, this is where things went wrong and we wanna not do that again? We ought to. How maybe did we go wrong? Well, maybe not proper repentance and reconciliation from previous errors, as discussed earlier. But also, could it just be that we're conformed to the world? Conformed. We're talking about social control and conformity. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. This isn't as much a social crisis as it is an individual spiritual crisis. Are we doing what the Bible says? Come apart from the world, saith the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. Are we immersed in the world's media? 
Because I'm telling you, the scholarship on mass formation misses a huge element here. And it is the priming for a mass formation event. When you are raised in and you are bathed in worldliness, in the worldly media and the worldly schooling agenda, it will, it will, it will habituate you to not being a thinker, to not measuring it by the scripture standard. And then you will go with the crowd. You will latch onto the current thing much more likely. It's not just the, the social con- context for the mass formation event. It's a social engineering agenda all along, every day, 24-7 for decades through the media and the schooling. I'll give you a couple sample quotes from the media and the school seminars. By the way, email me. I'll just send you a link so you can watch the whole seminar. That's beltoftruthministries at gmail.com. The founder of MTV, Robert Pittman, said, the strongest appeal you can make is emotionally. If you can get their emotions going, make them forget their logic, you've got them. At MTV, we don't shoot for the 14-year-olds. We own them. The founder of Modern Public Relations, Edward Bernays, the nephew of Sigmund Freud, a specialist in propaganda, literally wrote the book Propaganda. That's literally the name of his book. He says, if we understand the mechanism and motives of the group mind, is it not possible to control and regiment the masses according to our will without their knowing about it? That is a chilling statement, isn't it? He's saying we can control the group mind and they won't even know about it. He also said we are governed our minds molded, our tastes formed, our ideas suggested largely by men we have never heard of. This was 1920s America, mass popular culture, and he gave us the 20th century media monolith. He said, we are, they are the ones, the, these who control these processes are the ones that pull the wires that control the public mind. Those are all quotes from the book Propaganda. Bertrand Russell, his quotes are so long, I just got to summarize them. They're all in the full seminars. But he says, the entertainment industry are the high priests of a new religion. He says, they set the value system, not the family. He says, all your churches combined couldn't do what Hollywood does to establish the value system to get uniformity of thought to happen. He says that the majority of will be engaging in the amusements, and amusements is a very interesting word, because the word muse means to think, and ah means to not. So it negates to think. Ah, amusement means to not think. And so it's the bread and circuses, the feed me with the entertainment, and we are in a state of ah, amusement, not using our critical thinking capacity, not come now, let us reason together. And he says, only a small minority are not doing the amusements. And they're negligible. They don't matter. Unless people get bored enough, I'm paraphrasing his quotes, but people get bored enough or some major crisis happens and people start asking questions about this system. The schooling system was funded largely by the Rockefeller Education Board, Rockefeller Institute, back in the early 20th century. And they stated in 1913, in our dreams, the people yield themselves with perfect docility to our molding hands. So you can see mass formation and social control is not an event that just happens in a time of crisis. It builds over generations of building institutions and processes of exerting social control upon every generation. This is again Bertrand Russell talking about schooling this time, not about Hollywood. He says the students will leave school incapable of thinking or acting otherwise than as their schoolmasters would have wished. He says, diet injections and injunctions will begin from a very early age. So that's that taking the children from the home, shape them on the social needing board. From a very early age, to produce the sort of character and the sort of beliefs that the authorities consider desirable and any serious criticism of the powers that be will become psychologically impossible. So you can see this has been building for quite some time. Oh, another one. You don't want to miss this one. Harold Rugg in The Great Technology says, a new public mind is to be created. How? Only by creating tens of millions of individual minds and welding them into a new social mind. Now we're looking at the schools here. He says, through the schools of the world... We shall disseminate a new conception of government. I used to teach government. I'd look at the curriculum, I'd look at the Constitution, and I'm sometimes looking at two different things here. Through the schools of the world, we're going to inculcate into the young people a new conception, a new one. Well, what's the old one? What does it say in that grand old document, the Declaration of Independence? That's what the book The Great Controversy calls it, the grand old document. And it says, why are governments instituted among men? 
to secure the rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, you go to your Bible, and you can see the role of government in Romans 13. The magistrate has been given the sword to punish the wrongdoer. And you might ask, well, what kinds of wrongs? Does he legislate over all ten commandments? The first four? The worship commandments? Or just the latter table of the Ten Commandments? This is a very important question. The founding fathers of this country got that right. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, nor prohibiting the free exercise thereof. But do not steal, do not kill, etc. Governments are instituted to secure life, liberty, and if you read the Constitution, it phrases it as life, liberty, and property. Now, let's think about that for a second in the middle of this quote. You got Caesar's domain, you got that which is between the individual and God. Is the body temple part of Caesar's domain? Do we render, let's think about this. Jesus said, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. Render unto Caesar that which bears Caesar's image, the coin he was holding. Render unto God that which bears God's image. Think about the scriptures on the body and and what we've recently just been through. Offer your bodies as a living what? sacrifice. That's worship language. The body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Worship language. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Worship language. So we say with all respect and honor due to the authorities in their proper domain that worship spiritual choices must be left to the individual. And if somebody comes along and says, well, you've got a bad conscience in saying you want to not take that or whatever, and and you may not appeal to conscience on that matter, they've just negated the whole concept of conscience by declaring what is and what is not conscience, and it is the refuge of tyrants. How about we finish the rest of the quote? They're going to give a new conception of government through the schools of the world, and what is this conception? It's It's a conception that will embrace all the activities of men. We would call that totalitarian government. And it will, it will postulate the need of scientific control. One more on the schooling. You do not want to miss this guy. William Torrey Harris. He did more to make America's public schooling system in the 1890s, like that of Prussia. The Prussian schooling model, there's a whole history to be told there, borrowing pages from the Jesuit methods of education. But this was the guy in America, which it started in 1844. I wish I could do the whole school seminar right now, but 1844 was the birth of electronic media and public schooling in America. We'll have to wait for another time on that. But he says this, 99 students out of 100 are automata, automatons. He says they're careful to walk in prescribed paths, careful to follow the prescribed custom. This is not an accident, but the result of substantial education, which scientifically defined is the subsumption of the individual. The the very definition of education in the minds of these founders of American public schooling is to subsume the individuality of the child into the collective. It was interesting he said 99 out of 100 follow the prescribed path. This, I don't know what the numbers were out on that plane that day, but maybe this is 1%. And an image to the beast is coming. We can recruit more for that one, for, to grow more than 1%. Maybe what we've recently been through, people are waking up and more open to scriptural truth and individual critical thinking. But you're seeing the priming. Are we evading and avoiding the priming for mass formation events is the question there. It's, it's a, an ever-present historical reality. Now, from social control to social credit. Have you heard of the social credit system in China? This, this has made Western press. It's, it's significant. You're, you're, you're familiar with this concept of a credit score, the FICO score. You pay your bills, your score goes up, you're, you're, you're credit worthy, you get loans. In China, it goes way beyond that to a, a score for all of your behaviors, like even things like sorting your recycling properly and not jaywalking. And it's basically a system that's trying to grasp all the citizens of China into a dragnet, into a database to prove their trustworthiness in social life, broadly speaking. There are 700 million surveillance cameras in the nation of China. That's half as many people as there are in China. And the Mandarin term for credit goes beyond our understanding of the word with financial. It goes to one's morality. And so here we have legislating morality, if you will, instead of self-government, one of the highest values in the West, or you say it was once uh, one of the highest values in the West. And 
you see in China people who don't visit their aging parents regularly or play a lot of video games, which we, we, we'd like to be in that group, but you get minus points by the state here. Remaining debt-free and volunteering for community service are two ways to raise your points in some localities. There are many social credit systems in China as plural. There's not one yet, but um, in other cases, behavioral data on social media and e-commerce platforms has played in, and who one's friends are on social media plays in to your score, whether you have a high or low social credit score. One city of 2.8 million people penalized individuals for inappropriate comments online. Uh, this, one, this one should sound familiar. Spreading false information online reduces your social credit score. By the way, the World Economic Forum, when you look at their agenda that they're meeting right now, the top bullet point of their agenda is that the greatest present risk in our world today is, I mean, you fill in the blank, nuclear war. I mean, it's like you could have a few. Uh, misinformation is the greatest threat to, to our world right now. Um, basically saying things the World Economic Forum disagrees with is the greatest threat to our world. So higher scores in China get you better health care, better access to public housing, better schools, lower taxes, shorter wait times at the hospital, access to public sector, sector jobs, access to mortgages, or you could state all those in reverse, a lower score. You don't get the mortgage. You don't get the public sector job. You're at the back of the line at the hospital with lower care. Back of the bus you go. You see a stratification forming here, a demonizing of and other those on the lower end of the social spectrum. Higher taxes, worse schools and housing, etc. And also the bad kids are regulated to economy class seating on the flights and the trains, prohibited in some cases even from buying property, which you might, people would be apologists of it, would say, well, it's not mandatory, you know, it's not, it's not all, you know, overreaching, but if you don't play the game, you're losing more and more privileges, so not mandatory is setting that bar for freedom pretty low. It's kind of like when the mandates were happening. We were, I read in a publication here, it said, well, this is not mandates, but you know what? If you choose not to, then you know you might not have a job. And at that point, that's, uh, that's uh, playing with words. But even manners, like eating on public transport, can affect your score in some places. Several provinces have used big screens in public places to expose and shame people, as well as personalized dial tones so that when somebody calls you if you're a debtor who hasn't paid his bills, they will hear that you are about to talk to an untrustworthy person. This is from the CCP 2014 founding document. The goal of this system, these systems, is to allow the trustworthy to roam everywhere under heaven while making it hard for the discredited to take a single step. And we might say, well, that can never come here. You know, this is a free society. Um, Revelation 13 begs to differ. It's going to go global from here in America. And it, it could be covert social control that we've already been studying this evening. But the overt is already happening as well in the form of cancel culture, which is a term that I think diminishes the significance of this. Terms like woke and politically correct and cancel culture don't necessarily, don't, to me, they don't really uh, communicate the gravity of what we're talking about. Uh, genocides and hard tyrannies start with movements like this, the demonization campaigns, the canceling, etc. We live in a increasingly regressive era, an illiberal era. And just take universities as an example. When I was in academia not that long ago, um, universities were actually legitimately liberal in ideals, meaning the message is don't trust the self-proclaimed experts. Psalm 146, put not your trust in princes. Question everything. Free thought, open dialogue. Be a nonconformist when necessary. But now with what seems like a quasi-religious devotion to a politically correct dogma, in this ironic name of diversity and tolerance, you get no tolerance for diversity of thought. The most important diversity there is, freedom of speech and thought. Emotional outrage trumps reason. Dialogue is banished. Dissent is maligned as hate. And a newly invented human right, apparently the right to not be offended, overrules freedom of speech, which is a religious freedom to go and speak God's word and speak truth. So there's, instead of traditional biblical values, there's an imposition of a counterfeit value system rooted in cultural Marxism, and it becomes a straitjacket upon the mind and upon the conduct and upon the speech, kind of like Puritans, right? 
Is this, is this the illiberal regressive new puritanism? And it's not just speech controls that are applied. These things tend then toward economic sanctions, which is a precedent to no buy, no sell, and things coming out in the future. Say maybe individuals have been, have been uh, fired or not hired or not promoted at their jobs because they don't align. How about no jab, no job? Taking away payment processors. This has actually happened for thought crimes. Removing privileges to use Uber, Airbnb, and other real-world applications. Actual debanking of politically incorrect figures. You could find in the hundreds stories of this thing under this not very scary sounding name, cancel culture, where people are deplatformed from social media because they're prominent opponents of the narrative or they're shadow banned on social media or there's been manipulation of search algorithms to suppress ideas that don't uh, align with the, the, the narrative. Corporate advertisers, this is interesting because there used to be a healthy skepticism for corporate power and now corporations are lauded for exerting their power to eliminate speech and they do so with much with much uh, influence comedians athletes other influencers canceled because of truthful but offensive speech and then of course the reactionaries will come in and say two can play this game boom secular restaurant owner financial penalties for you if you are open on Sunday this is in the document, Mandate for Leadership, Project 2025, 2025 publication. It doesn't name restaurant owners. It's, that, that was an example. It's employers, even secular ones. They must pay time and a half for being open on Sunday. So you get the reactionary response to all of this craziness, and this is of immense concern. And then you get a book like this. I could not get past the introduction of this one. I was listening to this on Audible. It's like, speak like a dragon on every page here. Uh, step aside, secular humanism. We've got so-called Christian nationalism. It's very important to say so-called there, I believe, because if this is an ideology, which in this book it is, that is saying impose Christianity on people through coercive force, through the laws, all Ten Commandments, that is not Christian. Because Jesus said, my followers don't lord it over. So this is anti-Christian uh, policies. This is what Antichrist did, right? How about the lamb-like beast? Why is it lamb-like? It's because it respects conscience. It's because it does not make laws respecting establishment of religion, nor prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So a lamb-like beast, a Christian nation, is one that does not coerce Christianity, if we get our verbiage right here. But 45% of Americans believe America should be a Christian nation. This made big news. You dig into the data, of those 45%, 6% define Christian nation thus. America should have laws based on Christian beliefs or that separation of church and state should not exist. So most of them by this phrase are not aligned with that. Most of them by this phrase are, I'd like to see Americans be Christians. I'd like to see people be moral and be nice to each other. When you look at asking Catholics, Protestants, Jews, and non-religious people, ask them, do you believe freedom, freedom of religion applies to all groups? You can see Protestants at 84% tied for the top among, uh, next to also the, the non-religious. So that's not to say that this isn't a, 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 a coming danger, but let's also be accurate in how we are presenting it as well. And then, of course, the dialectical interplay intensifies. When you hear that craziness, people go, ah, Christian nationalism, and you get this sort of thing of, well, climate change, we're going to have Sunday over here. You can see it from both sides, right? Sunday being associated with climate change in the Pope's encyclical cyclical and climate lockdowns. The World Economic Forum's um, Yuval Noah Harari said, well, COVID wasn't an extremely deadly virus. And look what we were able to do. Shut down entire countries. Stop all flights. And this should give us some idea of how we can better deal with climate change, lockdowns, etc. The International Energy Agency, climate change and car-free Sundays. There's so much more we could say, but I'm about out of time. Jesus said, the last days are like birth pangs. And you know when you see these developments, he said, you know that the time is near when you see the signs of the times. 13 years ago, my wife learned we were pregnant. She was pregnant, and she knew, not from experience yet, but she knew that what was coming before the baby was born is immense pain, but to be followed by the greatest joy of her life. And she relished the fact. She relished the fact. So 
This is going back to do not fear. Jesus said, my peace I leave with you. Lift up your heads. Your redemption draweth nigh. We can relish the fact just the same as a mother anticipates the birth of that child, even though it goes through much pain. We know persecution is coming, and that will refine us and try us as gold. It's just a matter of enduring with the patient endurance of the saints and the strength that Jesus provides to us. So if you get nothing else out of a message about the signs of the times and things are happening, it's just stay connected to Jesus Christ. Live and move and have your being in him. It is his righteousness alone, our title to heaven and our fitness for heaven. And if we are thinking, oh, no, this is outlandish. This is going to be years down. Oh, it couldn't possibly happen here. Don't underestimate the potential for a cataclysmic event to happen out of nowhere to catalyze changes overnight. And as you see on the graphic, and you remember from 2020, and then all of the craziness of 2021 and the tyranny of that dark time, you see changes can happen very quickly when people get into that mass formation. So simply, be ye also ready. And I can be ready in the righteousness of Christ right now. I can say, I claim the promise in your word, Lord Jesus, that he who cometh unto me, you will in no wise cast out. And I come to you and claim that promise. I want to come to you and not be cast out because I know you are coming soon. And if we claim that promise, it will open up the treasure house of all of God's promises. And at that moment, we are already as safe as though inside the city of God already. Every principle of our republic is being repudiated before our eyes. So what do we do when this once free nation is morphing into something unrecognizable in several directions? We simply say what Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. We look for a better country and heavenly don't become partisan. Stay principled. Speak the truth of real religious liberty as a witness to God's character and an entering wedge for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then shall the end come. Uh, thank you very much, Brother Scott. That was a very powerful presentation. We've been blessed by your words. And just have just a couple of questions uh, that uh, some people have been asking. Uh, the first is this, how as parents do we nurture a sensitive conscience in our children? The first part, uh, do not touch the fruitless works of darkness, have nothing to do with them, and come apart from, from the world and be separate, say it the Lord, touch no unclean thing. But that's what we're not doing, right? That's not most of the story. Most of the story is that bond, is that family bond, re restoring what God meant for that family to be. And when they see it in their parents, they see the character of Christ, and we teach them line upon line, precept upon precept. We have family worship, and we make sure that that's our number one job in life as parents, then they will catch it, and they will have every opportunity opportunity to see the light in that and to walk in it. I think that's a very appropriate answer. And we as Adventists talk about the health message. We focus on new start, and a lot of it focuses on uh, the health of our bodies. But you're talking about the health of the mind. Yeah. Uh, do you see that um, talking about fasting from social media and cleansing the mind as a helpful evangelistic tool for people who are dealing with depression, social isolation, and fear? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. The mental health benefits from fasting from media are enormous. And uh, there's Dr. Victoria Dunkley who does Reset Your Child's Brain. She take, puts, some, puts kids on a three-week media fast, adolescence. This helps for everybody. But within three weeks, she's got patients who've already been diagnosed with ADHD, depression, anxiety, etc. 80% of, of her patients have the majority of their symptoms gone in three weeks. So it really helps. And that's not to say, you know, we're broadcasting on social media, right? Our Belt of Truth Ministries is doing a lot on social media the last nine months or so. So we're trying to go there where people are, but it's not suited for everybody. Not everybody's psychological makeup is going to be a good match with social media. And so the best way anybody can do that is test. Like when you go to the optometrist and test a new set of lenses and you go, huh, I can see better with that when he flips that to that, that, uh, that lens. And then you go, I think I want to live life more in that direction. So the less media, especially especially entertainment. When we're talking about Hollywood and the music industry, that's a different category than using platforms that can be used to God's glory and for evangelism and they have a function. Mere entertainment and amusement in the Hollywood variety is something as Christians we want to steer clear from just to maintain our spiritual purity and not enter into the, the, the haven of demons. 
Uh, thank you. My final uh, question here tonight is you have faced cancel culture yourself. <laughs> your name has been um, besmirched, your honor um, uh, questioned, and people have questioned the validity of your ministry. How have you maintained such a sweet spirit towards those who have uttered words against you? It's they're children of God, and that's their view, and, you know, I just got to do what I know is right, and so I don't really think about it that much, actually, quite honestly. It's just you, you put your head down, you get, you get your shoulder to the plow, and you do the work God's assigned you, and don't be elated by applause, and don't be dejected by censure, and people will say what they're going to say. Amen. Amen. We'd like to thank Brother Scott Risma for coming and sharing with us tonight.